Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. We've got another act, uh, exciting uh, episode of Security Matters for you today. Um, this is going to be very interesting. We call this the future of safer communities and stick around because I believe uh, you'll learn today that um, prevention of some of these atrocities, some of these tragedies that are happening in our neighborhoods, in our communities, um, can be prevented. And we're going to talk about why. We're going to talk about that with Rick Shaw. He's with us today. He's the CEO and founder of Awarity. He is also the author of a recently published book, The First Preventers Playbook, um, as opposed to First Responders, which is uh, sort of right of boom. If you hear right of boom and left of boom, this is a book about getting left of the incident, getting ahead of the incident and preventing it before it occurs. Uh, Rick, I really appreciate you taking the time today to, uh, to join us. Um, I finished the book this morning myself. Um, absolutely um, practically applicable ways to get engaged with prevention. I love it. I was like, wow, we need to start this not only in my company, but in the broader security community in Hawaii as a beginning, and then just let it grow out. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, Rick, I'd, I'd like, I usually start with letting my audience kind of learn a little bit more about you. Um, I know you've been around this, get this game for quite a while. But uh, maybe for those who don't know you, uh, just kind of share your background as much as you'd like to share and uh, kind of bring us up to the present. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to share. So, so yeah, I'm kind of a prevention geek. It kind of goes all the way back to uh, sixth grade. Actually, I wrote about it a little bit in the book, too. But, um, you know, I went, uh, there was this girl that was uh, special needs and kids would bully her and tease her. And I kind of stepped in and got some friends to step in and teach her to step in and you know, we made life a whole lot better for this girl because she was having seizures and things. So I, I kind of learned at an early age about prevention. Um, and then later on in life, you know, my uh, I had a daughter in school, not in Columbine, but Columbine happened. And so it really got my attention. And, and so I really started looking into prevention as far as not just violence, but even cyber. I used to, uh, even before Awarity, I started a company called uh, CorpNet Security. We did a lot of white hat hacking, the good guy hackers. And again, we're looking for holes and, and gaps that we can close down to prevent the bad guys from getting in. So, so that's my background. I had CorpNet turned into a Werity. Uh, been doing research for the last 20 plus years, really looking into as many different uh, failed preventions, if you will, but incidents and tragedies and atrocities, like you mentioned, really looking into those and trying to figure out, was it preventable? And if it was, why wasn't it prevented? And it basically helped me to identify what I call the uh, profile of a, of a failed prevention. And uh, where, where a lot of the research seems to focus on the, the profile of the, like the shooter, the mass shooter or the school shooter or the workplace violence. And again, that's good research, but my focus was really different in really looking into that profile of the failed prevention. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what the book's all about. That's what we're all about here. And uh, we really you know, try to help organizations to connect the dots, as I like to say, we can talk more about that, but, you know, connecting the dots and, and uh, trying to see that bigger picture so we can get involved earlier, like you said, left of boom. Yeah, it, it's super important and it's great work. I um, did, um, did it, did you finally have to just lay it out for people in a book? Um, I, Cause you've been at it for a while. Did it, what, what inspired the, the writing? Did, was there too many, were there too many non-believers or was it just overwhelmingly complex at, at the larger scale? Cause it seems, really straightforward and maybe it's just the way you laid it out and you know I'm a pretty simple guy so um it appealed to me like immediately so thanks for making it palatable yeah yeah no I appreciate that too um but you know it is complex it is no doubt or it can be um but there's definitely a lot of non-believers when I when I do speaking a lot of times I would ask the audience how many people thought like Columbine or Sandy Hook or Parkland or something like that and not just schools but mass shootings and, and other places as well but how many I'd ask them to raise their hand. I'd say, how many think this is preventable? And you know, they'd be two or three hands go up. Wow. Um, and that's about it. And usually those two or three people had read the post-incident report. And that's, I had been doing the same thing. So when I'm doing all the research, it's like, wow, this is preventable. And this is, this is how, and la -di -da, -di da And then I would go to these sessions and see that people were not doing the research. They didn't have time, you know, lots of reasons why. So I thought, yeah, I need to I need to share this research with people, but make it easy so they don't have to spend 20 years like I spent 20 years, you know, going through all this stuff. But even like you said, I think what 90 minutes to read the book or so, you know, I mean, and now they can uh, kind of get caught up. 
yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it gives you hope because you've, you've made, you've made prevention probable. Like in other words, this is, if we do these things, we have a, a very high probability of intercepting um, an, an incident before it occurs. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the red flags that are generated. You mentioned it a little bit and, you know, the research tends to show that all, all of these incidences or, or nearly all of them, there are red flags that other people encounter, people in the community, maybe it's law enforcement, maybe it's a school official, people encounter the red flags, but they don't put them together over time and, and follow someone be, to the point at which they go, you know, uh, active with their, with some, and start some sort of an incident that ends up tragic. Um, is, is this a, how, how would you say it's almost 100%, would you say that it's really rare for someone to just go crazy one day when they've never been crazy, you know, and do something really outlandish based on your yeah, research? Absolutely, yeah. Most, and most of the other studies too, uh, when they look at the profile of the individual, say the same thing. They're like, nobody just snaps. There's always okay. this escalation. A lot, of term, a lot of people use the term escalation. Okay. So there's a lot of, uh, when these, I, and I use the term at-risk individuals. What I mean by that is someone who has a grievance, somebody yeah. who, you know, is looking for revenge. They lost their job or they've been bullied or, you know, whatever the case. And unfortunately today in our environment, you know, with COVID and things like that, yeah. the number of stressors um, have, have soared and so have the number of at-risk individuals. And mm. so the problem is even a, you know, worse today than it was before. But, you know, back to the red flags is, yeah, there's almost always people, they, the term leakage is another term that people sometimes might hear or might okay. use. They're leaking their behavior. So like when they're going through this escalation, going from a grievance to where they start wanting revenge, and then they start sort of planning or having ideations really first, and then mm -hmm. they start having ideations, they make comments, or they might put stuff on social media, or they tell a friend, they tell a family member, they tell a classmate, a, 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 you know, a, a colleague or something. So they leak these things out over time. Um, sometimes that time can be years. Sometimes it can be months. Sometimes it can be weeks, but still plenty of time to intervene and disrupt. And so these red flags can be, you know, comments, they can be pictures, they can be like pictures of guns or pictures of what drawings of what they might do to someone or thinking about doing to someone. But that's all part of that, you know, escalation where they're just basically heading towards that point where they're getting close to that attack. And they start planning and they start preparing and those kind of things too, because, you know, especially if it's a shooting, uh, they go out and get a gun, they go out and practice, they get, you know, maybe their, their bulletproof vest, they get ammunition. I mean, they do a lot of planning mm. so we can stop those. But it's not just the shootings. You know, I want to make sure that people understand that it's also like suicides because yep. right now suicides are really have increased a lot because of like um, work from home, school from home, things like that. But same thing with suicides is a lot of times people leak out some of these different feelings. They're depression and things they're dealing with. So whether it's depression, I mean, whether it's suicides or whether it's shootings or whether it's workplace violence, there's things that sort of boil come to a boiling point over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I uh, wrote a little paper on LinkedIn. I spent quite a while back now, but it was, am I my brother's keeper? You know, and I wondered in there, or I proposed in that paper that when someone expresses to you that they're having these problems, we, we, it's really incumbent upon us to, to take that on. And we, we may not be counselors and we may not, but we need to see that they get some help. You know, the, they, they are expressing this for a reason and it, the reason can become tragic. So, you know, it's, um, I think part of that is that, that, um, that, that maybe people are afraid. I know you talk in the book a little bit about the people are afraid to use certain types of helplines to report things because they don't want to be called a snitch. Um, uh, that, that type of idea. Um, is that a, a prevalent problem, um, like just in the broader, you know, in the workplace community, in the school community? I know with kids, it's a big thing, like, oh, gosh, you never want to be a snitch, you know, and, uh, um, you know, maybe that lack of anonymity really is preventing a lot of the reporting um, that would, would, would help these people that are at risk. Uh, great point, and it is a big problem. Um, snitching is mm. a big problem, and it's not just for kids. A lot of adults don't want to, they might not call it snitching, you know, they might want to say, I sure. just don't want to get involved. I yeah. don't want to put my job on the line. I mean, it's the same idea, just a different description, I guess. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's a big problem because people do see things. And there's really, I'm going to 
oversimplify because there's more reasons than the two I'm going to mention. But the main re one of the reasons is snitching, like you said. They, they just don't want to come forward. They don't want to get involved. They don't want someone to retaliate against them. They don't, you know, there's lots of reasons why they don't come forward. Um, there's also reasons like maybe they don't want to go to a law enforcement website to make mm. the report. Okay. That it's just not, they just don't, some people just don't trust law enforcement websites. Uh, it's sad, but it's a, it's a gap that's gotten wider and wider. So there's those kinds of things. And then there's the, um, the other part of it, and we can drill down further, but the other part of it too is is there's probably all of us have had an experience where we've told someone, whether it's a friend, you know, we've called the police, we've told our boss, we've told, you know, a principal if we were in school or whatever, we've told someone or even told like law enforcement. And then our perception is, is nothing happened. Mm, and so the yeah. next time we see something, we don't always, you know, it's like, well, they didn't do anything last time. Why would I tell them this time? Yeah. So there's kind of the two sides of it there where some don't want to because of snitching. Some don't want to just because, hey, I told them before and they didn't do anything. But both of those are really bad <laughs> yeah. because we need those. Like you said, we need those red flags. We need those concerning behaviors. And a lot of times, um, and this has happened a lot of times in the manifestos. And a lot of people I know probably don't sit around and read manifestos, but I do. Um, <laughs> a lot of times in these manifestos, if they do leave one, they'll say that they were actually trying to get caught. They, I mean, they wished someone had stopped them. They're, they're trying to get help. They're struggling. But when nobody comes forward finally to help them, they're like, well, I'll just carry this thing out then. And wow. then they go through with it. So, you know, that's another sad thing that, again, the research sort of uncovered for me. It was like, dang, you know, a lot of these guys didn't even want to do what they did. Um, they just didn't get the help they wanted. Yeah, that that it's like there's a... There's an inability for them to communicate or to connect with someone that, that listens to their grievance. And so it becomes, you will, you will listen to me by some crazy, you know, some action that they take out on many people or whatever it may be. It's a, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's um, maybe something we, we could even begin to address earlier in schools, you know, to teach, to teach communication, to teach empathy. A lot of these things that are kind of circulating back through the corporate world today and hiring, uh, hiring and HR practices of, of listening to other people, you know, really listening and engaging with their story and right. uh, understanding that we all have pain and not being, uh, not being embarrassed by our, uh, the things that scare us or whatever it may be, right? I mean, this is just part of the human condition. Well, um, that kind of leads to another part of the whole instant reporting piece of the red flags. And that is that they get so scattered. Uh, um, you know, and I talked about that in the book too. It's just that unfortunately, we keep adding more and more and more incident reporting options. I, I mean, there's like this flawed thinking or just, uh, you know, I don't know what exactly why, but we keep thinking, well, if we give people more and more ways to tell us this stuff, you know, these concerning behaviors and stuff, that's a good thing. Well, it sort of is, but yet <laughs> if you have, you know, pieces of the puzzle that are scattered all over the place. In other words, like we saw with Parkland, for example, um, and, and there's a, a map you can throw up or a timeline you can throw up on the screen if you've got it handy, but you, you, in the post incident report, there were all these puzzle pieces all over the place. Um, but they were, you know, some went to see something, say something at the federal level, some were at the local law enforcement level, some were at the student level, some were at the administration level, some were at friends and family level. They were just scattered all over the place. So if you go to the next uh, little silo slide there that's coming up, um, you'll, we'll, what we found was is, no, not that one, I'm sorry, the, uh, the one with the circles. There you go. That one is, shows how these pieces of the puzzle, they had all these pieces of the puzzle out there, but they were scattered. And they were mm -hmm. scattered across you know, hundreds, if you will, of different sources, instant reporting, people, departments, systems, locations, you know, police had been to his off or to that shooter's house over 30 times, but the school didn't know. Wow. That. wow. So it's those kinds of scattered things that we need to have then a smart funnel type of approach, which is that other picture, but the funnel that brings all these sources together. And that's really one of the probably the biggest things I see over and over and over over the last 20 years is that everything's scattered. It's just that we got to, you know, we need better ways to bring it together. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's a good spot, I think, to take a break, because I want to come back and talk about how we're going to build these safer communities in the future. Uh, stick around. We got a one minute break. We'll be right back with Rick Shaw.
Hey, Aloha, welcome back to Security Matters. We're talking with Rick Shaw about the future of safer communities. Um, his new book, um, the, um, uh, the First Preventer Playbook. Uh, I, I highly recommend you get your hands on this uh, and get started with it. We're, we're building into how you go about building a, a community of helpers, of first preventers. Uh, but we were just talking uh, before we went to break about the, the, the disparate reporting mechanisms, you know, incidents, let's call them red flags prior to an incident about people are getting sent into all these different um, um, catchment systems, let's call them that. And those systems don't talk all the time and they don't talk very well. So Rick, um, your, what's your research sort of indicate there? There are literally probably hundreds of these types of catchment systems for red flags that just don't talk. Yeah, they, they don't. And it's, they are basically almost every single one of them is a silo. And wow. that's, you know, that's the sad thing is, is that, and that's the fact we, we do a lot of research with kids and surveys and we find out that when they report bullying, and this is 10, 20,000 kids. Now we've, we've done survey with only about 18% of the time do things get better. Wow. And usually that's because they've told a trusted adult and then, you know, ended up in that I'm not blaming trusted adults. It's just, they only have that one piece of the puzzle. They don't see everything else out there so they mm -hmm. can connect the dots and see the bigger picture. But that's exactly what we're seeing, whether it's bullying, like I just described, or some of these mass shooters or, or these workplace violence incidents or, you know, suicide or the human trafficking, drug abuse. Yeah. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's the same kind of thing with all of them. And you're right. It's just that a text line may not connect with a hotline, which doesn't connect with an app, which doesn't connect with, uh, you know, the verbal someone telling someone and things like that. And so we need that, like we were talking about funnel. We need a smart funnel approach that not only collects it all, but then gets it to the right team members because, you know, the right team members are like suicide team is going to be probably different than a, a, a person who's threatening weapons. Okay. Sure. So not only do we have to collect it, then we have to route it. So that's why I call it a smart funnel because it's going to collect it and then route it and share it with the right people, the right team members and the right resources. And like you and I were talking, those could be subject matter experts. Those could be law enforcement. Those could be legal. They could be uh, behavioral, uh, mental health, you know, those kinds of individuals too, because what we find is most communities have those resources. Maybe not all organizations have those resources, but communities do or states do or whatever. The, the resources are out there. It's just, they're not being, you know, connected very well. Mm. Yeah, and it is, um, it, it looks like a fairly, not, not daunting effort, but to, to get everyone together, to understand the value of the working together, what information can they share, um, it could definitely be an, a full-time job for several people once it gets to the community level, uh, obviously. So we do need some funding behind um, some of these efforts. But a lot of these folks are doing these jobs already, like school counselors, for example, probably have files on uh, incidents that are potential incidents that are, are at risk, you know, uh, students that have been brought to them. Obviously, law enforcement has people that have been reported for at And a lot of this information, I feel like, is... Um, Maybe those organizations protect that, like they feel like there's there's a safety or a security um, confidentiality sort of uh, wrapper on that information. But um, if if the uh, uh, if that person's escalating um, their behavior or they're they're getting further along, there's an idea of duty of care out there um, that maybe allows them to share this information. Could you could you talk about that a little bit? Because it's brought up in the book, and I don't know if everybody understands. Um, you know, when it's kind of incumbent upon them to share this information about a potential problem or a potential yeah. at-risk individual. Yeah, duty of care, duty to report, things like that, absolutely correct. Um, the duty of safety for organizations to provide a safe environment, things like that. Uh, but some of the biggest barriers are FERPA and HIPAA. Okay. Right? Uh, and that confidentiality you're talking about. So people are, are hesitant uh, I'm not picking on anybody here when I, when I, cause I'm not trying to single anybody out, but like counselors, you mentioned, I mean, sometimes counselors have information and they don't want to share it, but it's just because they don't have the right tools because they don't really want to put it into a student information system because okay. then it could paint the kid's record for, you know, all of school. Um, so they don't want to put it in there or they don't think they can share it. So having, again, this secure community approach with this funnel that feeds into this community platform what that does is it helps you take advantage of the rules of HIPAA so you can share it. You just got to share it in a secure way 
and only secure share it with team members. Same thing with FERPA or the education environment. So it's actually something they can do. You just got to have the right tools to do it, you know? Mm. So, um, but that's a misunderstanding that I see a lot out there. And so uh-huh. people hung up on thinking I can't share it or I shouldn't share it, but that's not correct. They really need uh-huh. to share it. Yeah, so we, we've mentioned with Parkland where law enforcement had been there 30 times. There's yeah. no reason they, they could have shared that, but they didn't have a funnel and a plat- secure, you know, community-wide platform to share that with their community-wide team. Yeah, so that information just doesn't get connected, right? Um, let's, let's talk about how do we build it out. So let's, um, let's, let's start with just a small example of a, of a, a subdivision or a, a small community. I don't know uh, on the mainland how like Thousand Oaks, California, I don't know how big that is actually, but in, in Hawaii, we've got like Eva Beach, we've got Waipahu, we've got smaller communities of probably, you know, 1,000 households or 500 households. There's a local school and a local high school, middle school. Um, let, let's, how, do we, how do we start with that? How do we get the book in their hands and then sort of engage them to put together a team that, that, that can then grow? You know, if you could grow those in each community, ultimately you could connect them with citywide resources and statewide resources, things like that. Yeah, great question. And, and that's one of the things that in the book too, it talks about Sarpy County, if you remember those. Yeah. We've got a whole county in, in Nebraska uh, doing this to where they've got uh, multiple school districts, multiple police departments. Now that's, that's the bigger end. But I just wanted to share that because it can be big or it can be, we've got small rural schools in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska and not mm. just Nebraska out there, but I'm just using two examples that in Nebraska that they, ones, you know, both ends of the spectrum, if you will, where they have just a small little town and they're using it to connect the dots in their small and leverage their resources that they don't have like in a school or a, a house mm. of worship or something along those lines, but they do have the resources in the community or at least in the state. So yeah, so they can ramp this up. Like you said, it's, it's really just getting together that community team. And I use that word loosely. I mean, it could be a threat assessment team, a risk team, safety team, care team, whatever they call themselves. But the idea is getting together these team members and then having a, a this part strategy and part tools, but to start putting in your strategies and your tools to say, how are we gonna collect all this information, route it to the right people so we can start taking more immediate actions that left of boom you were talking about, you know, the weeks and months ahead of time versus waiting until we have to scramble our first responders to respond to a situation. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not hard. It really isn't. Um, I mean, the book helps, but, you know, certainly we're all about helping people so they can contact us, obviously, but we want to help people see that that strategy and those tools are not that hard. They're not that expensive and they just, they help them leverage all their resources. They currently have it's just they're not connected together so they can you know they're not very usable yeah i've definitely heard from i've heard more you probably read more in the paper and things like that here locally in our in hawaii uh, about the lack of resources right the, the schools aren't funded and the, the behavioral health systems are overwhelmed and the homeless on the street are being kicked out of behavioral health centers and all these types of things um are there are there grant resources are there federal funds available maybe that we can bring into a state or into a community from the state, have you seen examples of that where where we could you know fund people to sort of do some of this work? Great question. And actually, we've had multiple uh, uh, entities, schools, communities, whatever, businesses, even too, go out and use grants. And those could be public safety grants. Those could be DHS, like Department of Homeland Security grants. They could be law enforcement grants. There's all kinds of different grants that we've currently utilized to get things started. And then like even Sarpy started with grants, but now it's paid for because they see the value of it. Mm-hmm. So they use the grants to get started. Another thing we're seeing that I'm really excited about is getting so like, um, you know, we, we see how businesses now are really trying to pull together, whether it's for economic reasons, you know, they need, they need business. We need to recover, right? but we can't have unsafe conditions for businesses to recover. And not just businesses, schools and everything else, but now businesses are taking a proactive role in basically joining together and, and basically it's more like a foundation or like a uh, mm. chamber of commerce. You know, I'm working with certain uh, different chamber of commerce right now where they're starting to bring the businesses together to basically stand this thing up and get it going. And that's yeah. exciting too, because that way we're not waiting for a grant we're not waiting for a law. We're not waiting for 
first responders, you know, or, and things like that. I mean, first responders are busy enough. We, we don't want to put this on them too. So that right. was one of the whole ideas behind, we got to have offense and defense, first preventers and first responders to bring that together. But the businesses, the foundations, um, they can, they can do that. Yeah, for sure. And I, uh, I'm going to propose that we work with the, the chamber here and that we obviously we've got a large hospitality community in Hawaii that's interested in protecting um, its um, guests. So there's, um, that's a, there's a good path forward that I'm going to put my, my safety director on that and see if we can't, can't make, get some momentum going here. Um, Rick, I really appreciate your time today. Any closing thoughts? We've got a minute or so left just to uh, share with the audience. My, my advice to them is to get moving, get started today. Um, but what, what would you share from your perspective? Well, there's, I would just say it's action. You're right. You, they got to take action because yeah. they're, I don't have it with me, but sometimes I, when I'm talking to people, I'll hand them a recipe for like chocolate chip cookies or a recipe for chocolate cake. And they look at me like, dude, are you crazy? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, what we're doing is we're doing that a lot of times with our guidelines and our recommendations and our reports. These are all recipes. Now they're good. we got to have them, but you got to get the tools to go make you know, make the cake or make the cookies. Mm. That's what's missing is we're, we don't always have the tools in these communities to make it, to bring the ingredients together and make what we want, which is a safer community or a, you know, a, a friendlier community, uh, a, a united community, those kind of things. But we can do that, but it takes action. And that's, that's what we want to help them with. Awesome. It takes action, folks. Get to it out there. Rick, I want to get you back in here a, a year or so after we get out of COVID and we'll see how we're doing on the recovery phase of this of our country and uh, see what you've seen with the research after that point. Thanks again for joining us today so much. I truly appreciate your time. Aloha Thanks. and aloha everybody out there. Take care. We'll see you next week.